get started with recording. Okay, so um, welcome everybody to our first intern teaching conference of the year. We are absolutely delighted to have you. Um, I'm gonna spend just two minutes doing very brief introductions um, and then we're gonna just uh, jump right into our first talk this morning. Um, Ken, thank you so much for being here. Um, anything that you wanted to um, say before I forget? No, not at all. I just want to, I just want to say a very special thank you to you um, for um, organizing this course. And I'm sure you'll introduce Emily um, Grossa Klaus, uh, a new curriculum director for us. And Andy, thank you so much for doing this talk every year for the interns. It's such an amazing lecture, and I really appreciate it. Gabby, back to you. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, so, um, as I said, welcome everyone to our first intern teaching conference of this summer. Um, this is a longstanding tradition at UW. Um, we're really um, delighted and appreciative um, that we are able to um, carve out this uh, special learning time for you every Thursday morning during the summer to cover some core topics um, in internal medicine with an emphasis really on the things that we think that um, you're going to see early on in intern year. Um, about um, management in particular. So we often use like an approach type of um, style, an approach to reading um, radiographs, which Andy's gonna do for us today. Next week, I'll be talking about an approach to cross cover, um, an approach to shortness of breath in the hospital, an approach to um, chest pain, those kinds of things. This is really um, an adjunct um, to the outpatient didactic curriculum that you're all getting in the immersion blocks this summer. So this um, lecture series really focuses on inpatient management. Okay. Um, I uh, am delighted to introduce Emily Rosenklaus, who is going to be our new um, R1 curriculum director. Emily um, is a, a, a hospitalist at the VA. Um, you'll be seeing her online hosting some of these sessions this summer, and then she'll be running and working with you um, this fall um, as we kick off the intern more on that later. Um, so just some quick uh, sort of rules, everybody, if you can make sure that you're muted. Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, I will be monitoring the chat. Um, although this is a large group session, um, sort of lecture style, there's lots of opportunities for um, pause and questions. And please, please, please put questions in the chat. I will try and um, pause the speaker at um, appropriate moments and get those questions answered. Um, everybody should have coverage for this hour. If you're finding that to be a challenge, please reach out to me, um, Ken, and CC your, um, sir, your uh, hospital chief so that we can make sure to troubleshoot that for you. Um, and this should be a dedicated hour of learning without patient care. All right, um, delighted to introduce Andy Lux this morning. Dr. Lux is um, a pulmonary critical care physician at Harborview um, and a really uh, truly outstanding clinician educator at the UW. So um, folks who are students here know Dr. Lux well, and we are lucky to have him kicking off our intern teaching conference uh, this year. Um, take it away, Andy. Great, Gabby, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, speak and uh, welcome everyone to the internship here. Looking forward to working with all of you. Uh, over the next couple of years when you come through uh, Harborview. I was actually just commenting uh, before many of you came on that when I was an intern back in 2000, I was doing these intern teaching conferences and uh, one of mine was led by Ken Steinberg on how to interpret PA catheter, so uh, quite memorable. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I don't have any significant disclosures to report regarding any of the information we're gonna talk about uh, in this lecture. Uh, in terms of the objectives for today's session, this is not really a talk about how to interpret a chest radiograph. That's too much to cover in this period of time, but we're instead gonna focus on things that you really need to be able to recognize and describe in radiographs as you're doing this, your work this year as an intern. So we'll spend some time talking about how to assess the positioning of lines and tubes, which we'll get asked to do a lot over the course of work. We'll talk about how to localize and characterize opacities how to identify pneumothoraces and other forms of barotrauma, which require immediate intervention, how to distinguish between massive effusion and whole lung collapse, and how to recognize less common presentations of pleural effusion. So a whole series of topics that should help with your acute management of patients this year. Um, before we get going, uh, as you go through the year, you're going to work with many senior residents who might comment on the fact that they work with me, and they know that I'm a bit of a stickler 
uh, for terminology. And if you rotate with me on your ICU block at Harborview, you'll learn this as well. And so I have a couple of terminology peeves uh, when I think about how to interpret chest radiographs. You'll notice that I call them chest radiographs, not chest x-rays, because you can't actually see an x-ray. It's a beam of energy. So we're interpreting films or radiographs. When you interpret films for your teams, everyone always is talking about the lung volumes, and they like to say that it was a poor patient effort when the lung volumes are small, but quite often it has nothing to do with the patient effort, and instead has everything to do with the technologist or the patient's disease. This term, poor inspiratory result, kind of took hold as an alternative. I don't think that's a great term either, so just describe the lung volumes as low, normal, or high. Um, it's important to recognize when patients are rotated when you're interpreting films because it infects the way things appear, particularly in the mediastinum. But a lot of times I see people struggling to try to figure out whether the patient's rotated to the right or the left. And don't waste your mental energy doing that at all. It doesn't matter. The fact that they're rotated is all that you need uh, to know. So you'll learn many of my other terminology peeves uh, in clinical care when you get to work with me uh, down the line. But with those out of the way, let's get started uh, with a case. So you had the opportunity to do a central venous catheter placement during your intern year, and you put a left internal jugular central venous catheter into a 24-year-old female with Down syndrome who was admitted with sepsis. The line goes in smoothly. There were no problems threading the wire or passing the catheter, and you appropriately order a post-procedure chest radiograph, which shows the following. So take a look at this film. Again, it was a left internal jugular central venous catheter placement. I'll let you look at that for a second. And now the film's gonna still be up on the screen and we're gonna ask a question about this and Gabby's gonna open a poll for you. After you've reviewed the film, what should you do next? Should you give approval to the nurse to use the line? Should you obtain blood gases off the line and the wrist simultaneously? Should you remove the catheter? Should you consult vascular surgery to move the catheter? Or should you consult interventional radiology to confirm the line position for you? Which is the appropriate thing to do at this point in time? Great, so everybody go ahead and put your responses in. Remember, this is completely anonymous. Put your nickel down, commit to something. That's how we learn. It's great, I'm seeing all these answers roll in. All right, 10 more seconds. All right, here we go. Can you see those results? Right. Yeah, I can see them. Great. So a lot of people wanted to remove the line in this situation. It's worthwhile to have some concern, but the appropriate answer in this choice is before you do anything is just obtain simultaneous blood gases off of the line and the wrist in order to confirm the placement. Generally, a central venous catheter should end in the superior vena cava, which is usually on the patient's right side of their body. In this case, it ends on the left side, which makes you concerned that that line actually may be in the aorta. But this patient has a congenital anomaly that's sometimes seen with Down syndrome, and that is a persistent left superior vena cava. So this catheter is actually in an okay position. And the way you would have found out it was a venous catheter placement would be to use the blood gases off the line and the wrist at the same time. So one of the things that's gonna occupy a lot of attention for you this year is checking radiographs to assess whether a line or tube that's been placed in the patient is in a correct position and the nurses and other people can use it as intended. For triple lumen central venous catheters, what you're looking for is you want the tip of the catheter to be at what's called the cable atrial junction where the superior vena cava meets the right atrium. And the way you find that, it's usually where the right main stem bronchus crosses the right side of the heart shadow over here, okay? Now, this is where you want a central venous catheter from the subclavian or internal jugular position to end. A femoral catheter will not come up this high. And a cordis catheter, which we use for volume resuscitation, is too short and will not make it to that uh, location. 
And for dialysis catheters, you're going to want the tip of those catheters to roughly be in the same location. Now, if you're ever unsure after a line goes in, and ideally you should be doing pressure transduction during the line placement in order to confirm that you've got venous placement, and also using ultrasound during the line placement as well for the same purpose. But if you're ever unsure after the line has been placed and sutured in, there's two things you can do to confirm whether you have a venous or arterial placement. The first is draw simultaneous blood gases off the wrist and the central venous catheter and look at the PO2 between the two of those things. Okay? If the PO2 is the same, you've got an arterial placement of that catheter, but if it's markedly lower than the radial, blood radial artery blood gas, then you most likely have a venous catheter placement. And then the other thing you can always do, particularly in the ICU, is just transduce a pressure waveform and measure the pressure off the line. And if you get a very low pressure, it's a venous placement, but if you measure extremely high pressure, it is gonna be an arterial placement. And then you need to think about how you're going to get it out. Now, another type of line uh, or tube that is gonna spend a lot of time telling people, hey, this is okay to use, is gonna be a feeding tube or a nasogastric tube. What you're looking for for these tubes is they should come down the midline of the body, okay, all the way to the below, and then curve below the diaphragm. And then they will usually head to the left side of the patient's body and then curl back to the right. And you want the tip of the catheter pointing away from the gastroesophageal junction, okay? So that's an ideal feeding tube placement. And if you ever see one of these feeding tubes breaking off the midline in the patient's chest and heading to the left or the right, it is very likely that that tube is actually in one of the bronchi and needs to come out, okay? Do not stress too much about whether you're, the tip of the tube is in the stomach or the duodenum because it does not change the risk of aspiration for a patient. Now, here's an example of a feeding tube that you would not want to use. This tube comes all the way down the midline of the patient, but it actually loops back in the stomach, and then the tip is pointing back up towards the gastroesophageal junction. This would be one in which you would ask the nurse to try to replace uh, the catheter. Okay. Endotracheal tubes are things that will be inserted in patients who either decompensate on acute care get intubated in the emergency department or out in the field, or sometimes in the ICU when their respiratory status gets worse. And it's often your job in order to confirm that the tip of the tube is in an appropriate position. What you're looking for for an endotracheal tube is you want the tip of the tube to be below the clavicles or no more than about six centimeters above the carina. And you want it to be about two to four centimeters above the carina itself. Endotracheal tubes that end too high in the patient's airway are at risk for coming out in an unplanned manner, so an unplanned extubation, while endotracheal tubes that are too deep, the risk is that you might have a main stem intubation. So you want the tip of the tube generally to be in this zone anywhere from about two to six centimeters above the crina, and if not, you'll be talking to the respiratory therapist about repositioning that tube. And then finally, even though chest tubes are more commonly used on patients on surgical services, you will occasionally have patients with chest tubes on your medicine service. And it's useful to be able to understand the appropriate position of these tubes. The majority of chest tubes, you want to, they'll be inserted into the side of the chest, usually in the mid axillary line. And the tip is typically oriented towards the apex of the lungs, okay? It's traveling behind the lungs up towards the top of the chest, as you see with both this right and this left chest tube. Occasionally, the surgeons will insert a tube that is intentionally pointed down towards the base of the lungs in order to drain fluid collections. And then another important thing you want to be able to identify with chest tubes, make sure that they're functioning properly, is within the radio opaque stripe, you will always see a gap in the stripe, and that's what's referred to as the sentinel hole. And you want to make sure that this hole, which is identified here with the arrows, is within the patient's chest. If it's out in the wall or in the soft tissues, that tube is not positioned properly, okay? So that's a little bit about recognizing the appropriate placements for central venous catheters, feeding tubes, endotracheal tubes, and then chest tubes. It looks like there's one question in the chat. Can I clarify what simultaneous blood gases mean? Simultaneous blood gases means that you're gonna simultaneously draw blood gas measurements from 
the catheter that you just placed in the internal jugular or subclavian position that you're concerned may be an arterial or uh, placement, and you're going to get a blood gas off of the wrist from a known arterial site at the same time. That's what that refers to. Okay. So now we'll move on to our second case. This is a 56 year old female who's undergone a kidney transplantation and she presents with dyspnea, productive cough, fever and back pain over a two day period. And there you see her chest radiograph, which I'll let you take a look at uh, for a couple of seconds. Okay, now I'm gonna leave the film up there. And as you, you reviewed the film, what should you do next? Should you start this uh, patient on ceftriaxone and azithromycin? Should you obtain a CT pulmonary angiogram? Should you obtain an echocardiogram? Should you start furosemide or should you do a right uh, tube thoracostomy or right chest tube placement? Great, so everybody looks like you're getting the poll. I'm going to leave this up for another 10 to 15 seconds as folks are getting their answers registered. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and end it now. Okay, so a smattering of answers here. The majority, or I'd say plurality of people went for the correct answer, which is to start ceftriaxone and azithromycin because this patient most likely has a pneumonia. Now, it turned out that this patient did in fact get a uh, CT pulmonary angiogram because people didn't recognize the key finding on the chest radiograph. And the CT pulmonary angiogram nicely showed a retrocardiac opacity that was consistent with pneumonia. And I'll take you through why this is the case, but it's actually present on the chest film and the CT pulmonary angiogram was probably not necessary in this case. So this patient had pneumonia and warranted antibiotic therapy. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking now about how to identify, localize and characterize opacities that you are seeing on films, which would be a key part of the interpretations that you're doing uh, this year with your teams. So one of the points I do wanna make is that when patients have pneumonia, if that pneumonia is in the right middle lobe or the lower lobe, it's generally quite easy to identify the opacities. But there is an area on chest films where opacities can lurk that can be difficult to spot if you're not being systematic and careful in your chest radiograph interpretations. And that is the retrocardiac space. In other words, the area behind the heart on, uh, within the chest. So if you look at, at the retrocardiac space, this is a normal film here, and this demonstrates what you should see. You should see, be able to see the, uh, the, the descending aorta along its entire course. You should be able to see the entire hemidiaphragm as it extends to the middle of the chest. And you should be able to make out lung markings through the heart here. So this would be considered normal. And here's an example of what a abnormal retrocardiac space looks like. Notice that you cannot actually see the descending aorta at all. You do not see the diaphragm. And rather than seeing nice lung markings here, this area is very densely opacified. So you have two examples of a silhouette sign where a structure is obscured by a lung opacity. And then this dense white area here, that would be called a retrocardiac opacity in the right clinical situation might be consistent with pneumonia although this can also be caused by atelectasis as well. So don't forget to look at the retrocardiac space, particularly when you have a high suspicion for pneumonia and you're not seeing other opacities on the film. So if you go back to this patient's uh, film, 
Notice that you can see the, the descending aorta as it comes down initially, but then the aortic stripe was lost. You still can see the diaphragm, but there's also opacity in this retrocardiac area here as well. So there were some findings on this patient's chest radiograph that were suggestive of the fact that she might have an opacity back there that could be consistent with pneumonia given her symptoms and the CT might not have actually been necessary in this case. Now, one of the things that's often useful to do when you are just finding opacities on films is to be able to localize where they are within the lungs. And you can use this concept of a silhouette sign in order to help distinguish the location of opacities. Remember the reason that you see things as distinct on a chest radiograph, so you see a clear border between the lungs and the heart is because the density of those two structures is different. The lung is not very dense at all. The blood-filled heart is quite dense. And because of that difference in density, you see a clear distinction between them on a film. But if all of a sudden the lung is filled with pus or water, the density of the lung tissue next to the heart is now the same and you lose the clear distinction between them on a radiograph. And we can use this principle of the silhouette sign to localize opacities. So if you have obscuration of the right middle lobe, excuse me, if you have obscuration of the right heart border, that tells you that the opacity is located within the right middle lobe. A right lower lobe opacity, however, will leave the right heart border alone and will obscure the right hemidiaphragm. A problem in the lingula will obscure the left heart border, while left lower lobe opacities will obscure the left hemidiaphragm and the descending uh, aorta. Okay. So if you look at this film, where is this opacity located? And you can put your answers into the chat if you'd like. Okay, good. I see a couple of votes coming in for left lower lobe, and that is in fact correct. Notice that you can't see the descending aorta, and you don't see the left hemidiaphragm at all in this particular case. So even though the left lung field maybe looks a little wider than here, but maybe I'm not really sure, there's definitely a left lower lobe opacity in this case. And this is an example of a right lower lobe opacity. Notice that you don't see the right hemidiaphragm at all, but despite a pretty distinct opacity in this right lower lung zone, you can actually still make out the right heart border. So that tells us that the middle lobe is not involved and this opacity involves the right lower lobe alone. Now you might ask, well, why is this actually relevant? Well, sometimes the location of an opacity plays into your differential diagnosis. So you might say, boy, I think this is aspiration pneumonia because it's in the lower lobe. And sometimes when you're communicating with us as pulmonologists, the location makes a difference of where the opacities are because that might affect where we're gonna do bronchoscopy if we chose to do that on a patient in this situation, for example. Yeah. And then another thing that's important when you are um, finding opacities on chest films is not only to be able to describe their location, but to characterize the opacities. And in particular, distinguish between whether you have an alveolar opacity or an interstitial opacity. And this is important because it definitely affects the differential uh, of what you're doing. So if you look at this film, do you think this film shows alveolar or interstitial opacities? And again, you can put some answers in the chat if you'd like. Okay, good. Lots of votes for interstitial opacities, which in fact would be correct in this case. So when you hear the term alveolar opacities, what that means is that there's some process that is filling the alveoli with blood, pus, cells, or water, okay? The opacity doesn't tell you what those things are. You need the other clinical information about the patient in order to help you tell what it is, but it just tells you that you have some alveolar filling process. And the way you distinguish alveolar opacities is that they typically have a very fluffy white appearance. And you, because the alveoli are filled with material, there's not a lot of black. Remember, black is air on a chest radiograph. So, so all those air filled, normally air filled spaces, the alveoli contain blood, pus, or water, they're gonna look white. So you don't actually see a lot of black in amongst those opacities. And then alveolar opacities will tend to obscure adjacent structures. So here, for example, you don't see the trachea 
outlined very well. In this film here, you don't see the right or the left hemidiaphragm or the heart borders very well because they're obscured by the alveolar opacities and the change in density of the lung tissue, okay? Now, interstitial opacities, what that refers to is that the process is leaving the alveolar space alone and is affecting the interstitial spaces in those interalveolar septa, so the walls separating adjacent alveoli. And these opacities are often described as reticular or net-like. And what you end up seeing is just a lot, a lot, a lot of white scraggly lines throughout the lungs. Okay. And you should also notice that in distinction to the alveolar opacities, which tend to be very fluffy and white, and there's not a lot of black within those opacities, interstitial opacities still have a lot of black that is seen within the opacities. And that's because the alveoli are still quite often open and therefore filled with air and air is black on a chest radiograph. So you see a lot of black areas in amongst those white scraggly lines. Okay? Now you will not always be able to make the distinction between alveolar and interstitial opacities. But when you can make this distinction, it is very helpful because alveolar opacities make me think about things like pneumonia, pulmonary edema, alveolar hemorrhage, whereas interstitial opacities are occasionally seen in atypical pneumonias but I think about these much more commonly with chronic lung diseases, like and things that end up in causing pulmonary fibrosis, uh, for example. Okay. All right. Now, before we move on to the next case, I saw that there was a question in, in the chat. Uh, and Jerry asked if chest uh, radiographs usually come with a lateral film too. And uh, it's a great question. It depends. And it depends on the status of the patient. So when you obtain portable films on a patient who is too ill to go down to radiology because they're decompensating on acute care or they're in the intensive care unit, you will only get an AP view. You will not have a lateral radiograph. You will get lateral radiographs when you order PA and lateral uh, radiographs in patients in clinic, or if a patient comes into the ED and urgent care and they're not so critically ill that they can't leave the bed in order to go over to radiology in order to do the PA and lateral. So laterals are great for trying to localize retrocardiac opacities, but quite often you have to make that call on just an AP film uh, as well, okay? All right, any other questions before we move on? Okay, it doesn't look like any. So we'll move on to our next case. It's a 36 year old female with a history of unprotected intercourse with multiple partners, as well as injection drug use who presents with sudden worsening of dyspnea that's been developing along with a dry cough over a three week period. So this person said dyspnea and dry cough over several weeks and all of a sudden now has the sudden onset of uh, worsening of that dyspnea. And here's the chest radiograph in this patient while she's laying flat in the emergency department. Okay, so I'll leave the film up there. And now the question is, you've reviewed it. What should you do next? Should you start ceftriaxone and azithromycin? Should you consult the pulmonary service for bronchoscopy? Should you order a CT pulmonary angiogram? Should you give this patient furosemide? Or should you order an upright chest radiograph? All right, everybody is looking like they're warming up this morning. Now we've got answers rolling in, which is great. All right, I'll leave this up for about 10 more seconds. Commit to an answer. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share our results here. Okay. Pretty big split in this case, Gabby. Yep. So this patient needs an upright chest film. 
It's important to note that they came in and the film is done with this patient for some reason while they're in the supine position. And they have a very subtle finding on this film called the deep sulcus sign, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. But this, when seen in a patient in the supine position, raises concern about the possibility of a pneumothorax. And the quickest way to confirm that would be to repeat the film with the patient in the upright position. The air, which is trapped in this location when she's supine, would change its position within the chest, and you'd see more classic appearance of a pneumothorax. Okay. So now we're going to talk about what I like to refer to as air that should not be there. So various forms of barotrauma that can develop uh, in some of your patients, which you definitely need to be able to recognize so you can institute the appropriate workup or management in a timely manner. So pneumothoraces sometimes are quite obvious, as you see in this patient. You have a collapsed lung here surrounded by a very large area of lucency with an absence of lung markings. This would be an obvious pneumothorax that's very uh, easy to spot. In some cases, they're a little less obvious, and you have to really kind of train your eyes on the film and look carefully for them. In this case, if you look at the left side of this patient's uh, left thorax, okay, you'll see there's actually a line here. And so you have lung markings out to this line, and then there is a thinner area of lucency on the side. So sometimes it's just a question of looking carefully at a film done with the patient in an appropriate position in order to identify a pneumothorax. Now, if you're unsure if a patient has a pneumothorax, you can do chest ultrasound, and I'll take you through the relevant findings that would help you rule out the presence of a pneumothorax. Or sometimes you would do a non-contrast chest CT, which can readily demonstrate the presence of pneumothoraces. Okay. So it's important to understand now that when a patient is in the supine position, the air can tend to get trapped within the costophrenic recess in a way that makes it difficult to see this classic appearance that you have over here or even as you see here on the left side of the screen, where you have that area of lucency lateral to the lung within the chest. And what you'll sometimes see when a patient is in the supine position is what's referred to as the deep sulcus sign. So you have an, a sulcus that is deep, narrow, and very narrow compared to the sulcus on the other side. So if you see a very deep and narrow sulcus and it's lucent within there, you don't see a lot of lung markings, and it's asymmetric to the other side, and that patient's film was done with them in the supine position, you have to think about the possibility of a pneumothorax. And then what you would do, if able, is repeat the film with the patient in the upright position. The air will change its location within the chest cavity, and a more classic appearance may be apparent. And then the other thing you can always do is perform chest ultrasound. And the key findings on chest ultrasound or you're looking for what's called the absence of lung sliding. So here is a, is a film of a normal uh, patient. And here you can see the pleural line here, this bright white stripe. And you can see it looks like it's moving. People often describe this as ants walking on a, a log, for example. This is what's called lung sliding. This implies that the pleural space is normal. It rules out a pneumothorax. Now you compare that to this movie on the right, and this is the pleural line here, but you notice that you don't have that same appearance of it moving. You don't see it again, what people describe as the ants walking on a log. And so the absence of lung sliding tells you that there is some problem in the pleural space. It doesn't tell you that it is a pneumothorax. It could be something else causing you know, pleural effusion, pleural thickening. There's some pleural space problem that could be a pneumothorax. It could be something else. Okay. So the presence of lung sliding rules out pneumothorax. The absence of lung sliding just tells you that there is some pleural space problem. Okay. Now, there are some other subtle signs of barotrauma, and in particular pneumothoraces, about which you should be aware. So here I've given you a cone down view on the left side of this patient's chest. And the key finding here is you can see these areas of lucency within the soft tissue of the chest. So if you ever see subcutaneous air without some clear penetrating trauma, so the person wasn't stabbed with a knife or you didn't just try to do some procedure in that area, that is usually a pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum until proven otherwise in that patient. 
So if this patient had fallen, for example, came in because of chest pain and you saw this radiograph, even though there's no obvious pneumothorax, the presence of the subcutaneous air would tell you, I need to look further for that. Pneumomediastinum is something that can happen in people who are spontaneously breathing if there's sudden, some sudden rise in intrathoracic pressure, such as they're snowboarding, they launch off a jump and then land on their back uh, while their glottis is closed. But we much more commonly see this in the ICU when patients are on invasive mechanical ventilation. Air ruptures out of the alveolar space, and rather than going into the pleural space, it tracks along the bronchovascular bundle to the middle of the chest and then moves through the tissue planes up to the neck and eventually the soft tissues of the chest wall. And here is how you, the evidence of the pneumomediastinum, it's these areas of lucency that you see along the heart border here on both the left and the right. And then notice that the soft tissues of the neck, rather than being nice and white as they are on the lateral aspects of the chest wall, there's a lot of black. And that tells you that there's air within the soft tissues because again, air has an appearance of black color on a chest radiograph, okay? So pneumomediastinum, often a complication of invasive mechanical ventilation, particularly in patients with the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, occasionally patients will develop pneumopericardium. So air that tracks into the mediastinum usually goes up into the neck and out to the chest wall but occasionally can dissect its way into the pericardial space. It often looks a lot like pneumomediastinum in that you will see lucency on the lateral aspects of the heart. But one of the ways that you can distinguish pneumomediastinum is, excuse me, one of the ways that you can distinguish pneumopericardium from pneumomediastinum is that you will see the air tracking underneath the heart itself. Okay? So you'll see a rim of lucency uh, on the inferior margin of the heart. Here's another film which you can look at for a second. And what do you think is going on in this particular case? And you can put some answers in the chat. Good. So everyone recognizing the key finding here was that this patient has pneumoperitoneum. You have an area of lucency underneath the diaphragm, very obvious on the right, but also present on the left. Now, unless you've done some procedure where you just put a peg tube in a patient or they just had laparoscopic surgery, pneumoperitoneum is otherwise an abdominal emergency. You're going to need to get CT imaging and call the surgeons to evaluate this patient uh, promptly. Now, one of the questions that often comes up for people is, well, how do I distinguish pneumoperitoneum from air in the stomach or the colon? Because quite often the colon or the stomach are right up underneath that left hemidiaphragm. And usually the way to do this is that when you have pneumoperitoneum, all you're going to see is a very thin band of tissue above the area of lucency, as you see here, and as you see here uh, as well. And that's because the diaphragm is actually not very thick. If you have the colon or the stomach trapped up underneath the diaphragm, that area, excuse me, I'm trying to find my cursor, there we go, that band that looks like the diaphragm is just thicker, okay? Because you have the wall of the stomach or the wall of the colon and the diaphragm together in this case, as opposed to the diaphragm alone here. So a thicker line plus the presence of haustra underneath tells you it's the colon, or a thicker line and just air would tell you it's probably the stomach, but a very, very thin band here, that's likely gonna be pneumoperitoneum, or at least I need to look more carefully to, to see whether or not my patient has this, okay? All right. So if there are any questions, I'll take a break there. You can put them in the chat. Otherwise we'll move on to the next case in just a little bit. Okay, so we've got a 62-year-old female who was intubated for respiratory failure due to left lower lobe pneumonia. She had a right subclavian central venous catheter placed after several unsuccessful attempts on the left. And four hours later, you called to the bedside due to the sudden worsening of her hypoxemia and an increase on her, in her static or the plateau pressures on the ventilator, okay? indicative of a problem with this patient's respiratory system compliance. 
So here's the chest radiograph. Okay, so you've reviewed this film and this patient who was admitted with a left lower lobe pneumonia had unsuccessful left internal jugular, left central venous catheter placement before it was placed on the right. What are you gonna do next? Are you gonna order a CT scan? Are you gonna do a thoracentesis on the left? Are you gonna put a chest tube on the left? Are you gonna start chest physiotherapy on the left? Or are you gonna ask someone to perform bronchoscopy? What do you think is the appropriate intervention? Keep those answers coming in. I'm gonna leave this open for about 10 more seconds. Okay. And here are our results. Okay, a lot of people wanted to either sample or drain this fluid. Only a few people here actually went for the correct answer, which is this patient needs some chest physiotherapy on the left. This person has whole lung collapse. They don't have a pleural effusion. Okay? So I'll take you through this issue here, which is how to sort through the patient who has a whiteout of their entire hemithorax. Okay? So, Occasionally, you're going to have a patient with a unilateral lung whiteout, and this is going to require some pretty quick decision making on your part. There's only a couple of things on the differential here. They either have a massive pleural effusion, and you'd be right to consider the possibility of that in a patient who had unsuccessful central venous catheter placement on that side of the chest because she might have had a vascular injury, or this patient who has a unilateral whiteout could have just collapse of their entire lung due to a mucus plug, a blood clot, or a tumor, for example, occluding the airway. So you need to be able to sort these out on the film itself because the management is going to be very different between these two cases. So how do you do that? Well, if you have whole lung collapse due to a mucus plug, blood clot, or a mass occluding the airway, what you will see is that the trachea is gonna to deviate towards the side of the opacity as a result of the volume loss. The heart is also gonna to shift towards the opacity and then you might see what's called a cutoff sign in the airway. And I'll show you an example of that in just a little bit. And also was, that sign was present on the film in the case that I just presented to you. Now, if someone instead has a massive effusion, all of that fluid built up is either gonna keep structures on the midline or push them the opposite direction. So in this case, the trachea deviates away from the dense opacity and the heart either remains in the normal position or deviates to the opposite side. So what you're really looking for to distinguish a massive effusion from whole lung collapse is what's happening to the other structures in the chest. Are they moving towards the opacity, which suggests I got a collapse, or are they moving away from the opacity or staying on the midline, in which case you're dealing with a large amount of fluid in the chest. Now, another important finding that sometimes helps you identify that it is whole lung collapse rather than a massive effusion is the finding of what's called the cutoff sign. So you can see here the airway comes down and then it abruptly ends. And this is an enlarged view of the same thing you're seeing on the left side of your screen here. The trachea bifurcates the main carina, left main stem bronchus comes down and then it abruptly ends. You don't see any more air passages beyond that. So this is another sign in addition to deviation of the trachea and the heart away from the, uh, excuse me, towards the opacity that point towards the possibility of whole lung collapse, which we're gonna manage by trying to get that airway open, starting with chest physiotherapy or maybe with uh, bronchoscopy as was necessary in this case. Okay. Now there is another form of collapse which you are often going to see on chest radiography, and that is right upper lobe uh, collapse. 
So what you'll see in these cases is you'll get deviation of the trachea towards the opacity. The minor fissure, which is typically down in the middle portion of the chest, usually shifts upward and towards the apex of the lung, okay? okay. So those in opacity in this area with the minor fissure that shifted upward and deviation of the trachea is quite often an upper lobe collapse. This commonly occurs as a result of a right main stem intubation, okay? But if your patient's not intubated or the endotracheal tube is in the appropriate position, you need to be thinking about something else that could be causing an occlusion in this area. Mucus plugs and blood clots can do that, but one of the considerations always is gonna be that there's a tumor in that area. This is one area where a lot of lung cancers tend to present. And this is one of the radiographic findings sometimes when they include the takeoff to the right upper lobe bronchus. Now there are characteristic appearances of other forms of collapse, such as a right lower lobe collapse, left lower lobe collapse, and left upper lobe collapse. But in the interest of time, we're not gonna be going through those uh, today. I went through the right upper lobe collapse because this is the most common form of lobar collapse that you'll be uh, dealing with. And then finally, we're gonna move to our last case. So this is a 55 year old male who presents with increasing dyspnea and left-sided pleuritic pain one day after he fell off a horse and presents to the emergency department where a chest radiograph is obtained. And there you see the film. I'll let you look at that for a second, then we'll put up the last question. Okay. So the question is, what should you do after reviewing this film? Should you start this patient on ampicillin sulbactam? Should you order a chest CT scan? Should you start chest physiotherapy? Should you do chest ultrasound? or should you place an epidural catheter for pain relief? What's the appropriate intervention here? this 10 more seconds or so, get your answers in. Okay, and here we go. Okay, pretty even split between chest CT scan and chest ultrasound with a little bit more folks going for a chest CT scan. CT might be okay. I think the appropriate thing here would be to start with a chest ultrasound because the appearance of this film in a patient who's in a supine position is pretty suggestive of the presence of a pleural effusion, which following trauma is most likely going to be a hemothorax. And an ultrasound would be the easiest way to confirm that there is fluid in the chest and therefore this patient warrants a uh, chest tube. So we're gonna talk about how to recognize pleural effusions on chest radiographs and in particular, some of the less common appearances. So usually on a chest film, the lung should extend all the way out to the chest wall, as you see here in the upper portion of the chest. So you should see lung markings all the way out to the edge of the chest. If you see lung markings end before the chest wall, that finding is called pleural separation, okay? it tells you that there's some abnormality in the pleural space. It could be a mass. It could be thickening of the tissue due to some inflammatory process. It could be a pleural effusion. But pleural separation just tells you, hey, I've got a pleural space abnormality. Now, we're all very familiar with the classic appearance of a pleural effusion. And what you'll see usually when patients are in the upright position, you have a dense homogeneous appearing opacity that obscures the hemidiaphragm on that side, may obscure the heart border if there's a sufficient amount of fluid in the chest. And when patients are in the upright position, you will see what everyone refers to as the meniscus sign. It's a classic appearance for a pleural effusion, not a lot of diagnostic uncertainty. The patient's not gonna need a lot of more evaluation before you perform a thoracentesis in order to sample that fluid. 
But occasionally, fusions can be a little bit harder to spot. So when patients are in the supine position, the fluid spreads out behind the lung. So you often have open lung on top of the fluid, and it creates the appearance that you see here in the film on this slide. Notice that there is a hazy appearance of the entire hemithorax compared to the other side. But notice also that while it's opacified, I can actually still make out lung markings through that opacification. And that's because I've got open lung sitting on top of the fluid and the radiograph is just kind of putting all those things into one uh, picture, okay? That's distinct than if someone had a opacity due to pneumonia in which I would no longer see lung markings in that area, okay? So if I see this in a patient who's in a supine position, I'm gonna think about the possibility of pneumothorax, excuse me, pleural effusion. I can repeat the film with them in the upright position or get a decubitus film. Or the other thing that's very easy to do is perform chest ultrasound, which makes it very easy to identify the presence of a pleural fluid uh, collection. Now, you'll also have to be able to spot pleural effusions when patients are in that semi-upright position. This is a common situation that we're dealing with in the intensive care unit. In these situations, rather than seeing um, a hazy opacity over the entire chest, quite often what you see in these cases is a gradient of opacity. We have very dense opacification in the lower part of the chest, but as you move towards the upper part of the chest, you see things become less white, becomes a little grayer in location. So if I saw this appearance in a patient in the semi-upright position, I would think that they've got a fluid collection. And it was demonstrated very nicely in this case with this patient who started with this radiograph. The conclusion was this was a pleural fluid, and in particular, there was concern about hemothorax. So they placed the chest tube, and you can see with drainage of the fluid, now the chest appears very different. And what this patient had was some other lung opacities obscuring the lung markings that were consistent with uh, pulmonary contusion following trauma. Okay? But a gradient of opacity going from very dense to less dense as you move up the chest in a patient in the semi-upright position is strongly suggestive of the presence of a pleural effusion. Maybe an underlying lung process too, but there's definitely fluid in that case. Okay? And then finally, a couple of other less common appearances of some pleural space abnormalities. So occasionally, pleural fluid becomes loculated. So here you see a normal appearance of the chest where the lung markings extend all the way out to the chest wall. If you look at the left chest here, the lung markings in the lower portion kind of get stopped right at this area here. So there's a band of opacity between the lung and the chest wall. This is some sort of loculated pleural collection. It could be the patient had an empyema and the fluid just got walled off in this loculation. It could also be some other form of pleural thickening or even a pleural mass. And then occasionally people can develop what's called a hydropneumothorax. In this case, you have collapsed lung air. So there's an area of lucency with no lung markings. And then this denser opacity here, but notice that you have a very distinct air fluid level in this particular case. When patients are in an upright position, you should not see a flat line at the bottom, uh, excuse me, at the top margin of that pleural fusion. You would generally expect to see the meniscus sign. So if I ever have air and an air fluid level like this, I'm concerned about hydropneumothorax, but in particular, this is just a much more complicated pleural space problem that you've got. That patient's going to need further imaging before you stick a needle in that chest to do anything else to try to sample uh, what's going on you may have a more complicated problem that you need to solve. Okay. All right, so we've reached the end and a couple of the big take home messages uh, for today. Remember, if that you are unsure of the placement of a line or some other tube, do something else to confirm the position, okay? So if you push a central venous catheter in a patient and you're not sure if you have arterial or venous placement, even after doing pressure transduction during the procedure, you can either check simultaneous blood gases off of the catheter and the radial artery in the wrist, or you can do pressure transduction. Okay? Remember that there are a lot of common problems that you're going to be seeing on chest films. Quite often you see the common presentations, but there are going to be atypical presentations for things. The deep sulcus sign with a pneumothorax, a unilateral hazy hemithorax with a pleural effusion in a patient who's in the supine position, 
and you want to be able to, rep, uh, to recognize these atypical presentations of the common problems that patients often have. You can use ultrasound, repeat imaging in different positioning, and then CT scanning if you're unsure of the findings that you've got on chest radiographs. And then finally, be systematic when you read chest films. Don't get sucked into the most obvious finding. If you're systematic, you'll identify all the things. You'll identify the most important things going on with your patient, and you'll be able to pick up subtle findings such as a retrocardiac opacity that would not otherwise be obvious to the eye. Okay. So with that, I'm done. I'm happy to take any questions. And then otherwise I'll wish you best of luck with your internship and look forward to working with you when you come through the Harborview ICU. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, what a great way to kick off our intern teaching conference today. Um, really appreciate you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.